is on rehumanizing the university. Um, I should begin by, by giving credit where it's due uh, to Bonnie Efros, uh, the director of the Center for the Humanities in the Public Sphere, and Sophia Akert, who's around here somewhere, who really have done an immense amount of not only work, but, but put an immense amount of thought into putting the series together over the last year and a half. If you have a copy of the program, if you haven't been to all of them, you can see uh, what an amazing uh, series it's been. So tonight, we're, we're, we're going to wrap things up. And uh, I feel like I ought to say a few words uh, about the topic um, before I turn it over to somebody who really uh, uh, knows what he's talking about. Um, you know, the, the relationship between the humanities and the, and the rest of the university, or the role of the humanities in the university, uh, is obviously a, a topic that a lot of us are concerned about these days. Um, but I think it's a topic that people in positions like ours have been concerned about for a long time. Uh, in fact, I think it's been a, a fraught relationship. I don't want to say from the beginning, but at least going back a long ways. So this year we're, we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act that created the land-grant college system in this country. Uh, and that itself, if you go back uh, and, and do what people like me do, which is read the original uh, the act passed by Congress and some of the conversation around it at the time, uh, I think actually, in a way, captured that, that tension, which is at the same time, the Morrill Act was this tremendous democratizing act about making, uh, you know, providing federal money via federal lands to build a series of public universities um, or to enhance the public universities uh, that exist very much, and in the language of, of the act itself, uh, to make higher education in this country really for the first time available to what the act referred to as the working classes. Um, and yet at the same time, the very same act made very strong reference to uh, educating people in the practical, art, uh, the practical arts, right? Uh, agriculture uh, and, and mechanical sciences and these sorts of things. And so going all the way back to really the, uh, the DNA of this university, there was this tension where we were democratizing and trying to make practical higher education um, at the same time. Uh, so it's not new. The tension's been there. Uh, I think we'll continue to deal with it into the, into the future. Um, so we're at a time now where, where there are a lot of, uh, I think, what people feel are attacks. I, I'm not sure that's the right word. But conversation about priorities, about the role of, of the humanities in higher education. Um, and, and without you know, getting into the topic of, of tonight's lecture, um, I, I simply want to point out one of the ways in which uh, the humanities is, is, is fairly healthy, I think, if, if challenged in some respects. Um, but we continue, for example, um, regardless of, of what uh, politicians uh, say about the need for various kinds of education and which majors are important or not important, um, we continue to have very robust enrollments um, in humanities courses. And we have lots of humanities uh, majors, so much so where, uh, well, uh, that a, a blue ribbon commission uh, impaneled by the state of Florida uh, feels that it needs to offer financial incentives to get students out of the humanities um, and into those more practical uh, sciences. And, and so uh, in that sense, I think there's a lot to be, uh, to, to, to be uh, happy about. Uh, you know, the idea that you've actually got to pay people to get them out of the humanities, I think, is a, a ringing endorsement. I'm not sure it was intended that way, but I view it as a ringing endorsement um, of what we do and you do and so on. So, so uh, let me then, uh, on that note, uh, introduce Bonnie Efros, who's, who's really been the driving force behind this, who will introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Th thank you, Bonnie. Oh, right. Well, good evening and welcome, and I'm so glad to see so many of you here. I know it's a very busy time in the semester, um, and um, it's with great pleasure that I welcome you here to the 12th lecture of our, our speaker series this year and also from last year as well. And um, it's also with some sadness um, that this, this series is coming to a close. But I want to tell you, um, and you've got uh, sheets on each of your chairs that indicate that we're not stopping here and that in the spring semester we'll be continuing the conversations begun sort of more generally with respect to universities both in the United States and in other parts of the world. And we'll be applying these discussions to the University of Florida. So we'll have a series of roundtables in the spring starting in late January that will address things uh, that are about the history and also about the present and future of the University of Florida. We'll have a roundtable on academic freedom, 
as well as one on diversity on campus and in the curriculum, an event that will focus on the Johns Committee and its legacy, and uh, we'll have also uh, an event that talks about the relationship between the humanities and STEM, and then we'll wrap up the term with a lecture, a public lecture, by Professor Sheila Slaughter of the University of Georgia, who will be talking about academic capitalism and the future uh, of state universities. So before continuing, though, with the introduction of our speaker tonight, Professor Brighouse, I want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge with great thanks uh, the support of the many entities at the University of Florida and in the city of Gainesville that have helped to make tonight possible. And in particular, I want to thank the Department of Philosophy for sharing their speaker with us, um, and we've benefited greatly from his visit. Um, I'd like to thank, in addition, uh, Sophia Akert, who's put an enormous amount of work into organizing these events, as well as Matt Delvaux, uh, Jamie Alberg, Debbie Whalen, uh, and Alethea Geiger in Shared Services, who've helped us prepare for the event tonight. And finally, I also want to remind you when the event is concluded that we'll have um, a reception and there'll be uh, a food and drink in the back uh, of the room that will be uh, open uh, to, for you to linger for as long as you like. And um, please also, if you're not on our mailing list and you'd like to hear from us more frequently, uh, do feel free uh, to add your name and we'll put you on the list. And if you decide you don't want to be on the list anymore, feel free also to uh, let us know and we'll be happy to take you off. Over the course of the past few years, um, Florida has seen its educational budgets, uh, uh, both for higher education as well as K through 12, uh, slashed. And what was a relatively prosperous university has been affected by successive years of painful budget cutting. As many of you know, although there's great optimism in other parts of the country and in even in other parts of the state of Florida, the University of Florida still anticipates further belt tightening ahead. Tonight's presentation by Professor Harry Brighouse is thus addressed at outlining potential responses to the increasing financial pressures and political scrutiny that, are, that uh, face universities today. He suggests ways in which universities need to combat the perception that they are disconnected from the needs of the public and from the needs of students, but he also underlines the necessity of undertaking meaningful institutional changes and given the slow rate of change at uh, many higher institutional levels, reforms at departmental levels, if universities, and particularly public universities, want to find their way out of current woes. In essence, he envisions ways in which our university might be further humanized, making college a more fruitful and successful experience uh, for the students who attend them. Moreover, part of a university education should include ways uh, sh should include finding ways to integrate into students' training a greater understanding of their ethical responsibilities to the rest of the population who are unable to attend uh, uh, institutions of higher education. So we hope that during the question and answer period that will follow Professor Brighouse's talk that there will be an opportunity for brainstorming about these issues both generally and as well as related uh, to the situation at the University of Florida. Professor Harry Brighouse is Professor of Philosophy and Affiliate Professor of Educational Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research interests range from theoretical issues about the foundations of justice to the evaluation of policies proposed for reducing the achievement gap in K-12 education. His book about the values that should guide educational, oops, excuse me, educational practice uh, entitled On Education, published in 2006, is widely used in teacher preparation courses. He's also the author of Justice, published in 2004, and Social Choice and Social Justice, published in 2000, and he's the main author of a work called Educational Equality, published in 2010. He's edited a work called Measuring Justice, Capabilities and Primary Goods, published in 2010, and The Political Philosophy of Cosmopolitanism, uh, Cosmopolitanism um, uh, published in 2005. He's the author of numerous works, pamphlets, chapters, and articles. I won't go into more detail here, but I will mention that he's currently working on a book about the value of family entitled Family Values uh, to be published with Oxford University uh, Press, and this is forthcoming. So without further cutting into his time, I'll stop here, and I'll ask that you please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Harry Brighouse for his talk this evening entitled How Can We Re Rehumanize the University Here and Now?
Thanks for having me. Um, I want to start just by thanking you for coming, um, and also then by deflating the promise of the title a little bit. Um, I'm not sure that the university was ever sort of fully humanized in the first place, so I'm not sure about rehumanizing it. Um, and I also ought to say that what I'm going to offer tonight is I'm going to start by offering, offering you an argument, a, a, a sort of argument, why humanizing the university or rehumanizing it is uh, morally urgent. Um, and that's why I changed the title. I added, and why. Um, uh, that's the first bit of it. Um, and then I'm going to give, to be honest, some scattered suggestions. I mean, they're, they're, they're organized in my head, but they may not seem particularly organized um, as I say them, uh, about how to, um, how to improve things. Um, where's this? Here we are. Here's the clicker. So I want to just start by saying what I'm really interested in is not just universities in general. About 60% of uh, Americans go to some sort of higher education, um, uh, and about 25% graduate from some sort of higher education. I'm not really interested in that. Um, I'm interested particularly in what I call elite colleges. Now, I know when the, your budget is being cut and your um, legislature seems hostile, um, you don't feel like an elite institution. Um, but in elite, I count, um, and this is a standard usage, I would count um, all select, highly selective and selective uh, colleges. That accounts, so that would include you, it includes UW-Madison, yes, it includes Harvard, it includes Wesleyan. Um, it includes most of the public flagships you've heard of and some of the public universities that are not flagships. Um, around, you know, depending on how you do it, you can get about 150 selective colleges or 400. Um, and if you take the 400 most selective colleges, you, uh, get for a, you account for about 25% of um, college students, which is about, you know, 10% or so, or a bit more than 10%, um, of the cohort of, of people of college age. Um, and I'm interested in them uh, because I mean, they're the people who will, uh, first of all, have the privilege um, of being in the top 10% or so of the labor market in the richest country in the history of humanity, right? Just to be clear. I mean, I know it doesn't feel particularly good right now, but compare with the whole of humanity um, and compare with the rest of the world. Um, that's a pretty privileged situation to be in. Um, and who will, uh, among whom will be the decision makers, the people who make decisions about how other people who didn't get to go to college um, live their lives, about how resources get distributed to them. They will be the people who will be running school districts. They will be the people who will be running uh, social work departments. Uh, they'll be people who will be running businesses and deciding whether those businesses are going to behave ethically or are going to behave uh, profit maximizingly. Um, because sometimes you have to make a choice, um, and we, uh, but sometimes you really can make a choice. Uh, so that group of students is the group of students I'm most interested in, and I'm interested in the institutions that you have to pass through in order to become part of that, um, that elite. Um, I've got two criticisms of elite colleges, um, and I'm not going to go into great detail, I hope, uh, about either of them. Uh, but one is that contrary to what we'd like to think, um, selective colleges do not contribute to social mobility. They do not contribute to equality of opportunity. What they do on the whole is they take relatively advantaged students from relatively advantaged homes, and they prepare them uh, for, or sometimes, to some extent, just certify them for relatively advantaged positions in our society with a public subsidy. And most students in these institutions um, get, a, get subsidies from, well, three sets of people. Their parents, um, uh, uh, the public, and dead people. So, uh, you know, Harvard, um, Princeton, I've heard people say that Princeton spends about $90,000 per student per year on the education of those students. Most of that money does not come from their parents and most of it doesn't come from the government. Uh, most of it, or at least half of it, comes from dead people uh, who left it. Um, and frankly, it could have been taxed away from an inheritance tax. We decided not to do that. We decided, them to, allow, we decided to allow them to leave that money so that it could be used uh, for the education of the most privileged people in our society. Um, jolly good. 
there's institutions that do that have some sort of obligation and students who take advantage of it have some sort of obligation. We don't contribute to social mobility. We need to think about what the implications of that are. That focuses my attention on people who don't go to college, basically, on the less advantaged people in our society. I think that if you take these advantages, uh, you uh, take on responsibilities to go into some sort of service to the people who don't get them. Uh, we're all in this together, and that should be reflected in the way that we educate our students. It should be the way that reflected in the way that we, as, uh, that those of us, I was once a student, um, take our education and what we then end up doing with it. The second complaint, though, um, uh, is not actually about, I'm not now berating students, I'm sympathizing. I'm not berating students at all. You'll see that as it goes on. Um, but now I'm sympathizing. I think colleges, especially residential colleges, now I think this is justified, in fact, that we have residential colleges. I think they do things for people that couldn't be done any other way, I think. Um, but we expose students to unusual risks. Um, risks that are associated with being in a very unnatural environment. Um, and my job, I would just say, my entire livelihood, I worked as a nanny for three months, um, and I worked as a furniture remover for three, and the rest of my life, my money has come from being complicit in institutions that do these two things. Right? I've depended on uh, uh, being part of a mechanism of social closure and exposing young people to risks of uh, harms that are really quite great um, and that I have not suffered but I know some of them do. Let me turn, first of all, to the, uh, um, the first complaint. Uh, colleges, how are they mechanisms of social closure? So colleges bring three basic benefits um, to undergraduates. There are three things that you get when you go to college. I mean, I know you get lots of other things too, but one is, uh, and the key one, the one that's really interesting in this uh, uh, context is increased competitiveness for the desirable positions and uh, benefits that are attached to them uh, in our society. That 10% of the labor market which is relatively advantaged. Now we'll just say the top 2%, 3, 2, 3% of the labor market is really quite a lot better than uh, the sort of 10th percentile and the 10th percentile isn't that much better than the 20th percentile, oh, sorry, the 90th, you know what I mean. Um, uh, um, but lots of benefits are attached, and I'll say a word about what they are in a moment. Second thing is people get the enjoyment of the college experience. Now, I will just say um, uh, I didn't get that, really. I had a pretty miserable time in college, um, so I always feel pretty good about this. You know, I feel like, you know, I got, I got the first and the third of these, but the second I missed out on, so, you know, that compensates in some way. I think, to be honest, when I was a student, I thought that. I thought, well... You know, I'm getting all these unfair advantages. At least I can be miserable um, in uh, response. And I, 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 I succeeded in that. Um, and the third is the intrinsic value of learning. Look, there's something you get when you go to college. If you go to a college where you take your education seriously and the people who teach you take it seriously, you get something which really you don't get in any other stage of your life, which is three, four, maybe five, possibly six uh, years of learning things. Lots of which, you don't care whether they're ever going to be useful. You just get the enjoyment of learning them. Now, that itself is really useful. Getting that experience is really useful, even if the stuff that you're learning isn't particularly useful. It's useful to you in your later life, and it'll be useful to others. It's a really great thing. I'm not going to talk about that very much. If what college brought you in that sort of top 10% of the labor market were just money, an income, you might think, well, you know, Brickhouse is kind of shallow to worry about that because, you know, money can't buy all, you know, it can't buy love and, you know, only shallow people care about money. Well, that mu I don't think that's true, actually, but um, let's suppose it is. That isn't the only thing that it gets you. It gets you higher status in society. Status really matters to people, and you might think, well, that's shallow, too. It might be shallow. It's the way human beings are. Um, uh, it also gets you more interesting jobs. My job is really interesting. Uh, my job is like, my friend Eamon Callan says that being a professor is the second best job in the world, whereas being dean is like the 17th or 18th. Uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, he thinks being a rock star is the best. Uh, 
Um, but as Tom Lehrer w- would, have, would point out to you, he was a, a, a popular singer who, who was also a math professor and gave up the popular singing because it was boring. But being, being a math professor was thrilling. Uh, why? Because if you're a pop singer, every night you go out and you give this, you know, they make you sing the same bloody song over and over again. But me, you know, I give a lecture and nobody comes in saying, oh, you didn't give that lecture that we wanted. I can do whatever I like. Um, it's interesting. I get more control over my daily life. I get better health. People in that top 10%, top 1%, they get longer lives and better health uh, than other people, which comes, it seems, from them having more control over their daily life. It it does not seem that they're just healthier people and therefore more successful. It seems that they're more successful and therefore healthier, um, according to uh, the best social science we have. So, uh, that doesn't seem so trivial to me. I've sort of gone down... Uh, as things, you know, things seem to get less shallow as you move down this list. And the benefits are really serious. Uh, if you're going to take those benefits, you might want to pay something back. And if you're going to give people those benefits, you need to think about what you're doing. Um, uh, I'll just, uh, maybe I should, well, no, I'll, I will do this. So, um, just to go back to our um, elite colleges, um, See where the students come from. Uh, the students um, in that top 150, 3% of the students in that top 150 come from the bottom 25% of the income distribution. Um, and they graduate at much lower rates uh, than the others. Um, those who come from the top 25%, 74% of students in, this, in that 150 colleges come from the top 25% of the income distribution. It's, we also have no reason to think this is going to get much better in the near term. So this is Sean Reardon's... I will, Sean Reardon, he was lovely to me. He gave me... I asked him for this graph, and he gave me a whole presentation with, like, 50 graphs, um, which, you know, all of which I think I've used in some way or another. Um, uh, and what this does is it shows you the increasing, the, the, the dotted line is the reduction in the black-white achievement gap since the uh, 1950s, since Brown versus Board of Education, which is startling. Um, and what the red line shows is the increase in the achievement gap between the bottom 10% and the top 10% of the income distribution. This is what's been happening. You see that the... Um, uh, oh, this is what's recording me. Uh, you see that the uh, line really takes off around about 1979, uh, which is when income inequality really takes off. Uh, basically, most of the, almost all of the benefits of growth uh, um, that have, have accrued in our society uh, since 1979 have accrued to the top 5% of the income distribution. There is some discrimination in admissions. There's certainly uh, some people don't do as well as they might out of financial aid. But by and large, the underrepresentation of lower income groups in selected colleges reflects their preparedness. Um, and their preparedness reflects uh, the amount of human capital and investment that has gone into them up to that point. Um, those, it's the Matthew effect. Those who are, 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 are academically rich get academically richer. Um, And they get richer in all those other ways that I've accounted. Okay. So, that's the the first really miserable bit. So, just to say, you know, the talk goes as... as, as, I'm about a quarter of the way through. Um, uh, It stays miserable for another ten minutes. Um, uh, And maybe even reaches a nadir in about ten minutes. Um, But then it's all cheerful after that. So, you can uh, cheer up. Now, some of you will know um, this. Sorry, I I got this from Amazon, as if you can't tell. Um, uh, I'm not high tech. i just say that. Um, uh, Some of you will be aware of this very discomforting uh, book. It's a study of early adulthood um, by a sociologist at um, Notre Dame. And it documents the engagement of emerging adults with uh, consumerism, (laughs) high engagement, Uh, politics, low engagement, alcohol and drugs, high engagement, um, and sex, um, 
whether it's high engagement or not, um, and you might think high engagement was a good thing, um, uh, uh, it doesn't look very healthy. Uh, the picture painted in this book, which is done from uh, surveys of students, uh, uh, sorry, of young people, um, people of college age, um, is very um, uh, disconcerting and unpleasant. And I've read it with a number of undergraduates now, um, undergraduates in classes where I can really talk to them and they will talk to me. And I have yet to find an undergraduate who reads this book and finds it uh, completely out of tune with their experience. Um, all the undergraduates I've talked to uh, have found it to be not exactly their experience, um, but completely consistent with everything they see around them uh, in their environment. I don't think it's particularly surprising that um, undergraduates uh, have this sort of experience, and it's because the environment we place them in is really weird. We take thousands and thousands of 18 to 24-year-olds, that's people who are at a very, um, at an age where they're highly susceptible to peer um, influence, who are trying to find themselves. We put them in a place where uh, um, uh, liquor companies, um, uh, clothing companies, big corporations can target their marketing. They can spend billions of dollars marketing to them, hundreds of millions of dollars marketing to them. Uh, we keep children out of the environment completely. Um, and we limit contact with responsible adults. So, you know, high school kids are uh, um, uh, also very susceptible to peer pressure, but most of them live in houses, and the houses sometimes have other kids in them, and there are other kids in the neighborhood, and there are adults in the houses who pay them sort of moderate amounts of attention. And when they go to school, uh, they talk, at le you know, if they're badly behaved, at least the principals talk to them. Um, and if they're well behaved, the teachers talk to them. And yeah, if they're in the middle, maybe everybody ignores them. Um, but uh, nobody, you know, they don't get completely ignored. Um, a lot of undergraduates at large institutions like this and like mine um, feel there isn't an adult for them to talk to when something goes wrong. Um, they feel there isn't. They feel they have to make a special effort. I mean, it's a, they have to break some barrier in order to have that conversation when things have gone wrong. Um, I thought that maybe a picture would tell um, 85 words, uh, which is the number of, I counted, it's the <laughs> number of cans. I don't know, I, I haven't been drinking alcohol long enough. I've only been drinking it for two years. Um, I know that sounds bad, but um, uh, I have. So I don't quite know what the bottle is, um, but it looks like the sort of thing that you, four people don't really want to drink a whole bottle of when they've been drinking 84 cans. Um, uh, um, the next picture is not so funny. So the next picture um, uh, is a banner left by a fraternity that was suspended from UW Madison in uh, 2007 um, for uh, various infractions um, in which sexual assault played a sort of serious role. Um, uh, and they left this banner that I'm about to show you up. Um, it was up for several days for the fraternity that was about to um, uh, enter the house uh, in their place. Um, if you read it, I would not have um, uh, done this myself. If you read it um, the right way, you will be able to tell that this is a chant. This is not something that somebody just came up with for the banner. Um, uh, now, women are going to marry these men? I mean, not all of them. Some of them are gay, presumably, despite what they say on here. Um, uh, <laughs> but many of them are going to be married to women. Um, and uh, women are in classrooms with these men. Um, women have to interact with these men and other men who might be like them. Uh, the um, uh, fraternity, when I um, looked at this with some of my students the other day, uh, one of them is the head of a sorority, and she said the fraternity has been reinstated. Um, sexual assault... I, I just want to say a word about it. it. It's, first of all, much more common than anybody likes to think it is. Um, it's, uh, th these, th this is, UW Madison students experiencing sexual assaults, and just remember, almost all of these people are women. So this is some sort of sexual assault, about half of which is rape or attempted rape, um, uh, in the past 12 months. 
Uh, so that is 14, 13% of the women on the campus in the past 12 months have experienced some sort of sexual assault. Um, in 6, 7% have experienced rape or attempted rape. Um, and their uh, attackers very often are people that they will see in class the next day who will walk around um, the campus, who they will see on the campus, um, who uh, may be stalking them. Um, uh, I think that people who talk to students about this, I mean, if you know enough students who've experienced sexual assault, you will know one who will say that they've been uh, stalked. Um, and if this happens to you, first of all, it's an incredibly disruptive experience. So I, I was pretty miserable as an undergraduate, but I didn't have any experience that compounded the misery so much um, uh, that it sent me into a depression or that it made it impossible for me to get up in the morning or that it made me just feel totally isolated uh, in the way that sexual assault can. I don't know if people have been following um, uh, about two, three weeks ago, a, a young woman from Amherst College um, went public with uh, her own uh, story, which, um, you know, uh, if you read it, it's totally, I mean, it's a completely authentic story. There's just no way any of this is, uh, you know, it's not made up. Um, uh, and uh, she talks about how, you know, essentially she had to drop out of college. I never experienced anything like that. Most people who succeed in college, most people who are academics have not experienced anything like that. Why? Because if you experience something like this, it disrupts you enough that you're not going to get uh, um, into that sort of uh, place. Now, I teach a class of 150 people, about 90 of whom are women, and, you know, they don't all turn up. And, of course, the women turn up at a higher rate than the men do, so, you know, about... Uh, um, probably 75% of the people in the room are women, and I teach about abortion. Um, and one of the examples that we use, in, uh, that is used in one of the classic uh, philosophical papers on abortion, uh, uses an uh, analogy with rape. And three, four, five women in that room have been raped. Um, and I'll be honest, first 10 years of my, um, uh, my experience as a teacher had never even occurred to me. I never gave it a... I mean, I just never even thought about it. Um, and I think that's true of most of us, is we don't think about that. We don't think about the fact that some significant proportion of our students are on psychotropic dr drugs. I don't mean LSD. I mean antidepressants or Xanax or whatever. We don't think about the fact that, you know, if you've got a large enough class, one or two of those kids is going to have some sort of breakdown in that semester. Um, you know, 400 people. You just look at the statistics. You're going to find this. Um, so... We put them in an environment in which that happens, and we have uh, very little... That environment includes very little contact uh, with adults. And usually, the adult that they see most often is a professor. The adult that they see most often, even if they don't talk to them, uh, is somebody who is a teacher of theirs who is talking at them the way I am now. Uh, we talked before at dinner um, about how the research shows that nobody can concentrate on somebody talking for more than 15 minutes. Um, and I said, I know that, but I'm going to talk for more than 15 minutes uh, anyway. Um, anyway, so we, we facilitate aids with social closure and we place students in risky environments um, as residential colleges and as faculty who are, um, uh, make our livings out of that. So, do we have some obligations that come from that? I think we do. I think we've got some pretty serious obligations that I don't think we necessarily take seriously enough. And those obligations have two uh, characters. One is, these students who are going to have advantage positions, uh, we're not going to do much um, about suddenly having a whole different set of students in who are less advantaged. We're certainly not going to do anything about the income distribution. Not here. I'm not going to do anything about it. Um, I, you know, I hope you might vote to do something about it. But it won't, not much is going to get done. That's not part of the political agenda um, on the national stage or on the state stage. Um, uh, but what you can do is you can equip and help to incline these students to do good, socially valuable things um, in the environment they end up in, in, in once they're there in society. Um, that's our job. That's a central part of our job. I would say, say that's the 
the central part of our job, really. Um, uh, to move into the less depressing bit of the talk, uh, as a segue, I'm just going to sort of give you an account of what I think um, that uh, involves, and I'll uh, then say a word about an alternative account. Um, so I uh, have a visual aid here. Um, uh, ah, sorry, I'm skipping through. I have a visual aid here, which is um, my only visual aid. I, look, I brought it in my bag all the way from Wisconsin. Uh, this is Derek Box, our underachieving colleges. I have to say that when I read this, my sort of view of my job completely changed. I know he was the president of a very uh, elite university, um, and that is reflected to some extent in the way this is written. Uh, but what he does is he uh, gives an account of what he thinks the main goals should be um, for students, an account, a sort of seven-point account of what we should really be trying to do for them, an account that I think most faculty would more or less agree with. Um, and he talks a lot about how to do it. First thing you want to do if you want to rehumanize the university is get every faculty member to pretend that they've read this book. Right? Um, it's a seven-point account that we'd largely agree with. I think that's what equipping and inclining them to uh, um, do good things in the world is. It is not the only account um, of what we should be doing in universities. There's another very popular account, um, which has uh, also, oddly enough, seven points. Um, and you'll recognize this from... Um, you know, what high school counselors say, high school and middle school counselors say to students, um, to, to young people, about why they should go to college. Um, and the truth is that, um, that's my joke, by the way. It's my, I'm technically incompetent, but I can make one visual joke. Um, uh, a student said to me, it looks as, to him as though people, you know, faculty, students, and... Uh, Society are looking for different things in the same place. We all come to this place, and what, what are we actually doing? Well, the faculty want to do research. Um, for, to, in an institution like this, very often the teaching is sort of a secondary, they think of it as a secondary part of their job. Um, uh, they, um, when they are teaching, they think in this sort of very liberal way, the way that uh, the Derek Bott way about what they should be doing. Students want to be prepared for a career. And, you know, to have a moderately good time and everything else comes second. Um, and the public actually wants um, students uh, to do valuable things. They want them to be equipped uh, and inclined to do valuable things, which is indeed, in this case, I think the uh, public is basically right <laughs> for once. <laughs> Sorry, not that I'm an elitist or anything. Um, so, we should rehumanize the university. That's the payoff. How are we going to do it? I've done the why, now I'm going to do the how. These are very scattered comments. Um, I um, have organized my thoughts around three basic principles. One is that we should improve student-faculty relationships, um, that student-faculty relationships should become more humanized, um, uh, that would make the environment less risky for the students, I think. Um, it would also, frankly, make it more pleasant for the faculty, not that that is my number one priority here at all. Second, we should improve instruction. I believe in like, you know, appealing to authority. So I believe that we could improve uh, our instruction um, as individuals. We could improve our instruction without huge amounts of extra investment of time, energy, and effort. As institutions, we could set frameworks um, in which instruction would improve without huge investments. Um, uh, and the third thought is about building character, and I'm not going to say anything about that because I know I'm not going to get to the end, and I, I, I know that um, we can talk about that later if you want. So, now I'm going to make some scattered comments about things to do. So, first, um, look, how do we learn to get better how, how do we learn to do research and get better at, at our research? I'm talking now to the faculty. Um, we have a very, very elaborate system, um, and we all understand what it is. We uh, scrutinize really high-quality research. We reflect on it. 
Um, we try to mimic it, basically. That's what you do in graduate school. You try to mimic the research. You get feedback, if you're lucky. Um, you get feedback from people all over the world, people you value, who you think are really good at this, who are really smart. Um, uh, and then you scrutinize some more high-quality research, and you just sort of, you know, keep, right? And you do that for the rest of your life. And you learn new things for the rest of your life, or at least for the rest of your professional life, and it's pretty good. Um, uh, now... How do we get better at teaching? Learn out and get better at teaching. So um, Dick Arneson, he's a philosopher at UCSD, he has not published this in a paper. He compares teaching to urinating. Um, and the thought is this. Um, you know, urinating is something that nobody really teaches you how to do. Uh, and you always do it on your own and nobody watches. Um, and uh, you think you're pretty good at it. Um, but really, you've no idea. Um, uh, I think that our approach to teaching um, and improving our teaching um, is really largely an evidence-free process. Um, uh, insofar as we talk about teaching at all, um, we um, do it very casually, anecdotally. Um, there's very little system in it. There is a lot of research about what makes successful teaching. Uh, the 15-minute rule, which I'm breaking, as you know, um, uh, there's a great um, piece of good fortune, which is that 90% of faculty members believe that they're above average teachers. Uh, so that is really reassuring to me. Um, uh, now, it's not wholly our fault. Um, we have been enculturated into an environment in which um, uh, this is how you go about thinking about teaching. Um, uh, and we don't have an infrastructure, we don't have a lot of institutional infrastructural support um, for improving our teaching, um, and that's, this is the result that you get. Um, this is a quote from um, Judith Warner Little, and this is a very old quote, actually, and I just want you to read it to yourselves while listening to me, because um, I'm not going to read it out here. Uh, She's talking really about K through 12, and she's really talking about middle and high schools. Um, uh, she's one of the early, uh, um, uh, she still works on this stuff, early people working in a systematic way on school improvement. Um, and of course, lots of this is, this is not done in uh, most middle and high schools. Um, but it could be done, and it is done in some, uh, and we could be doing it. We could be watching each other teach. We could be um, providing each other with useful, if potentially um, uh, frightening, evaluations of our teaching. How do you learn how to do something? You watch somebody who's good at it doing it. You watch somebody teach and you think, okay, that's a really good idea. I could do that. Or, my God, that's good. There's no way I'm ever going to be able to do that, so I'm not even going to bother to try. Right? You see people all the time. In my, in my discipline... Uh, if you want to. In my discipline, um, in my field, uh, political philosophy, Michael Sandel has these, uh, who does a 1,000 person class um, at Harvard every year. Um, his lectures, you can watch them online. Uh, my friend Corey Mason, who's a legislator in uh, uh, Madison, said, said that when I sent him the link, he was in a very dull uh, assembly meeting. And he, it was late at night, and he started watching uh, Michael Sandel lecturing about justice, uh, and then colleagues would come over and sort of peer in and see what it was. Um, you can wa I've watched Sandel, and to be honest, you watch half an hour of Sandel, you're a better teacher. I, I, I mean, I've learned loads of things about... I've learned to try out lots of things, many of which have worked, just from watching him, just from watching things he's done that it wouldn't have occurred to me to do. We could do things in our departments differently, so I've done a little... I'd like to do this. I only came up with this a couple of days... Oh, yeah. Uh, I only came up with this a couple of days ago. Um, uh, if you look at this, so again, this is just for faculty. The undergraduates will find this shocking, if there are any undergraduates here. There are people who look young, but, you know, everybody looks young to me now, so... Um, uh, I shouldn't be rude about my colleagues. And I'm not being rude. 20 years in a single department. Um, 
when we have discussed teachings, teaching in our department meetings, um, almost all, I would say 90% of our discussion has been about graduate curriculum. Most of the rest has been about the curriculum for the tiny percentage of students who are philosophy majors who are bound for graduate school. A minuscule amount has been about other majors and non-majors. And, you know, instruction, forget it. Uh, we don't discuss instruction. Um, the truth is also that most of these discussions have been about extremely small changes that I don't think possibly could have affected in a significant way how well educated or how much learning uh, was happening. Um, uh, we obsess about them. We could change that. As a department, we could change that tomorrow without anybody giving us any money, without, any, without the dean doing anything nice for us. Um, conceivably, if we did, the dean might do something nice for us. But if not, that's life. Uh, we'd have improved things quite a bit just by shifting... Uh, all, most of this discussion over here and a good deal of this discussion down to here. Um, okay. Um, I don't want to... Oh, I guess I'm not doing so badly on time as I thought. Well, anyway. Uh, the next... As I say, these comments are a bit scattered. So the next one is about um, graduate training and incentives uh, prior, uh, sorry, during the tenure track, prior to tenure. I've got the slide wrong. Um, so, actually, in, in, uh, my, the graduate students in my department um, uh, came to me about a year ago now, um, knowing that I have this sort of quirky interest, knowing that I go on and on and on about um, Derek Bott, um, saying, well, you know, we're interested in teaching and we do a hell of a lot of teaching and we'd like to be a bit better at it. Um, can you help us? I said, no. Um, and they decided that what they would do is they'd develop a voluntary group. They meet about once a month. Um, sometimes I meet with them. Often it's on their own. Um, they, dis they share papers and discuss how they should grade them, what constitutes good co comments on them. They have talked about what skills they think people who are in the classes that they're teaching, the 101 type classes, um, should be developing. So that they're developing a common language about the kind of things that we should actually be teaching. They uh, mercilessly um, watched Michael Sandel, one of the Michael Sandel lectures, and pointed out to me all sorts of things that were wrong with it that I hadn't noticed um, that he was doing wrong. And they less mercilessly, because I was in the room, did the same with one of my lectures. Um, uh, we could do that. We can provide... They're doing all this without anybody paying them, without any incentives. The truth is it's taking them about an hour every month and it is taking the guy who, the wonderful guy who is organizing it probably about another couple of hours a month. Um, the improvements, you know, I can't measure them. We don't have measures. We don't have good measures of learning, and we don't have good measures of the increasing of learning. Um, maybe it does no good at all, but I don't believe it. Okay, next thing. Um, so, uh, this is something I did. Um, uh, I taught a class which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a mi minute, um, uh, with 20 freshmen in it. I taught it in 2007 as part of a program that the uh, university runs um, for, for freshmen. Um, and I taught it again in 2010, and I was having uh, coffee with one of the 2007 uh, uh, students um, that July before I taught, and she just said to me, Is there, I know you're teaching it again. Is there anything I can do to help? And I just, this sort of this just momentary thing of, yeah, you can come to my class um, and tell me what I'm doing wrong. Um, I'd like you to come and just sit in and tell me everything I'm do doing wrong. Um, and uh, she did. Uh, I paid her. Um, uh, the guy who runs the program immediately gave me money to pay her with. Uh, Ten bucks an hour, really cheap. Um, my hunch is that the people who really know about um, effective teaching in a university are the 10% of undergraduates who really reflect on the experiences they have. I don't think faculty, by and large, know as much as those 10% do. The key is whether you can recognize those 10%. That is whether you can find them and identify them and get them to talk to you. Paying them helps. Huh? It's a good idea. 
I just give you some examples of things. You know, these are just small things that she uh, said to me. Um, one day I cold called a girl for the first time who looks like a, you know, a, you know, a rabbit in a headlight or something. Um, and afterwards Emma said, it's fine to cold call and I think it's a good thing to do. She's very good on the positive reinforcement bit, right? Um, uh, uh, but you have to warn them beforehand. So I warn them beforehand now. I say in my classes, I'm going to cold call. I'm going to feel totally feel free to cold call on you and that's life. They don't mind. They're happy to do that if they're warned. She pointed out, that, uh, this was more recent, she pointed out uh, in a discussion that basically, uh, which I thought had been a good discussion, she said, every single student that spoke in that discussion, you jumped in before they'd finished. I thought back, and it's absolutely true. Why? They were freshmen, it was three or four weeks in, I was eager to affirm them. And in doing so, I distorted the discussion. Um, and she pointed it out to me, and I didn't do it again. And part of the reason I didn't do it again was that she kept being in the room. <laughs> so I'd be embarrassed if I did. Uh, the day I knew that things were going to go really well, this was about three weeks in, she had said to me uh, in the previous class, uh, the previous week she'd said, look, this is really difficult material. It's really challenging for them. I think it's really good that you're doing challenging material, the positive reinforcement again. But you have to break off every 15 minutes and sum up so they know where you're uh, going. Uh, and the following week, um, we went and sat down outside. It was still warm. It was September. We sat down outside together. Um, and she said, well, you didn't do what we agreed last week. And that was the moment where I knew, okay, this is going to work. She's going to tell me off if I do things wrong. Um, uh, and she did. Uh, I only know of one example of this. So Utah Valley University has institutionalized something like what I did. Um, it has uh, a program called Students Consulting on Teaching. They hire undergraduates, and any faculty member can go to these undergraduates um, and uh, get anonymous feedback. They can get the students uh, to, um, uh, they can do training with them. The students get trained. Um, uh, they're paid like students are paid, so it's cheap. You can conduct a focus group with a class. They can film the class, act as a faux student or create an original approach to improve the teaching and learning environment. It's a very impressive program. Um, uh, and again, it's something that can be done very inexpensively. There is a theme here, right? Because even though we're the richest society in the history of humanity, um, uh, we, don't, um, we don't spend all that money wisely. Um, so we have to be careful how we spend it. Okay, so I, um, let's see. I want to go for about five more minutes. Is that all right? Um, I'm going to talk about two more things. I'm not sure what the second is, but I know what the first is. So uh, this is the program I was referring to. Um, and uh, a dean, an assistant dean, develop, started developing this program. So there are, there, there are models all over the country of this. Uh, he started developing at UW-Madison about 12 years ago. Uh, now about... Um, I think about 25% of our freshmen are involved in this program. Uh, what you do is you take um, uh, three thematically li linked classes anchored by a 20-student 20 seminar. So what they do, I, I, my example, I offer a class called Children, Marriage, and the Family. They can take my class. There are just 20 of them in it. If they take it, they also have to take Sociology of Marriage and the Family, and they will all be in the same discussion section in that class big lecture class, they also have to take um, uh, an early human development class, a, a, an early childhood development class. Um, I, in my case, because I know and am interested in the sociology and the psychology literature, I look at their syllabuses in the other classes, I figure out my class sort of around them so that they encounter things in my class that they will later encounter in the, in the other class, or they encounter something in the other class and then um, uh, they get to f reflect on it philosophically a week later in my class. Um, uh, we target at-risk students. It's not a remedial program, and most of the students in it uh, are not at risk. Um, most of the students are, are, are regular students. It has spectacular... Um, you never know about selection effects. You never know... I mean, uh, you know, the at-risk students are pushed in. Um, the... Uh, 
we, we haven't tried to do a real experiment around this, um, but the effects on GPA distributions, the apparent effects on uh, um, uh, attrition rates uh, for these students relative to others are spectacular. These students, on average, come in with much lower GPAs and SAT scores, and they leave with much higher GPAs at the end of their four years or five years or six years, and they graduate at a faster rate than others. Um, and this is what they say. This is, again, I, I think we... Um, sorry. You can see I'm not very good at this. Uh, um, I had to... Well, anyway, th this is from sort of surveys. When you ask the students what they appreciate about it, they appreciate um, the fact they got integrated learning, they appreciate the peer cohort, but they also appreciate the fact that when they get to college, they get to know a responsible adult who they can then, if they, you know, it won't happen in every case, but they feel they can go back to. They feel they can go back to in times of crisis. Um, they feel they can go back to. I have, uh, I mean, it's a very special experience for me. I have one student, I can't talk about her, really, um, who, but, you know, I could name you the day when she uh, told me she was going to drop out of college. Um, I know exactly what the date was. I remember it absolutely vividly. She did it over email. Um, and the truth is, the next day she'd have dropped out of college if she hadn't known me. Um, I didn't do anything. I just said, we're going to go to the dean tomorrow and the dean will sort you out. She said, who's the... What's a dean? Sorry. <laughs> I went in with her. And the dean sorted it out, and she graduated in five years, and she is going to be an absolutely fantastic social worker. How do you pay for this? So this is expensive. This isn't a cheap one. Now, my, uh, my guess is this. My guess is that changing a 400-person lecture into a 500-person lecture, the marginal loss of quality is trivial using that increase in, uh, from a 400-person lecture to a 500-person lecture um, to free up uh, a faculty member um, to teach a 20-person seminar for incoming freshmen, um, I think the gain, I'm sure, is massive. Like, I'm sure. Evidence-free. Um, uh, but, you know, you can guess that if I'm sure, I'm probably right. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is mentoring. I've got a lot on this. If you want it, I've, I've got a lot more about the FIG uh, experience. Um, uh, we're all, all faculty are all mentor students. We all mentor students if we talk to them at all. We all have effects on students. Even when we uh, ramble on and on and on in class, um, we're having an effect on them. They listen, they pay attention. Sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't. Um, the way we carry ourselves affects them. Um, uh, we think we are not trained to be mentors. We're totally unsystematic about it, more unsystematic than we are um, about uh, teaching. Um, uh, we don't generally make deliberate choices. I will say I never thought about mentoring. I never thought about it as any part of my job. I never thought of myself as a mentor until six years ago, um, uh, um, uh, a, a newly elected assembly person, uh, I was invited to the, his victory party um, in his office at the legislature, and he introduced me to the parish priest who baptized him, I will just say, of entitlement, I don't mean that in a rude way, um, that enables them to go up to a faculty member and say, hey, I'm really interested in this, whatever. Um, there's a whole bunch of students, especially the most at-risk students, who don't have that sense of entitlement and who get locked out of mentoring. Um, uh, we, should, um, uh, we should probably have more diversity on the faculty um, uh, of kinds of people, um, but we don't. And as long as we don't, uh, I think mentoring is, you know, we need more training in it, we need more thought about it, we need more discussion of it, um, but it's something that we um, uh, should engage in in a more reflective way than we generally do. Okay, I'm going to skip to the end. I had a whole lot more to say, but I won't say it, about the humanities, about differential... I'm happy to talk about differential tuition uh, between the humanities and STEM majors. I'd love to do that. Um, 
sorry about this. It's really frustrating to see such outstanding PowerPoints and then uh, realize you're not going to hear these things. Um, uh, but I want to say one last thing, which is just we, we were talking about this um, uh, uh, at dinner um, about online um, education. Um, so I would I think that there is uh, on, online education is going to transform the way we do things in the next ten years. I don't understand the business models. I was told at dinner that nobody does, so that's great. Um, uh, I, we don't really know how it's going to work. Um, uh, already we use, and I'll say, you know, the truth is that I use this Learn at UW thing, our online little bit, um, and I am almost completely technologically incompetent. I really hate any technology that's less than 300 years old. Um, uh, and even I can make interesting things happen um, on, online. Um, so I, I really do think it's a fantastic tool. Uh, but potentially there's a massive digital divide going to open. And the digital divide is not between students who have computers and students who don't have computers or have internet access and don't have internet access. The digital divide is between people who can learn outstandingly well, who can do a lot of learning um, through computers, and people who for their learning need to have uh, personal embodied relationships. I think that second category is about 99.5% of the human race. Certainly, if I had had to learn everything online, there's no way I'd have learned much at all. Um, uh, embodied relationships prompt learning in important ways, enable learning to happen. As faculty members and as administrators who are thinking about faculty, uh, how to organize faculty, we need to take that very seriously. If we're going to complain about online education and worry that it's going to do us out of a job, we had better show uh, that the embodied part of the learning experience is really important, and we need to take it very seriously. And now, finally, I've uh, done much more than 15 minutes. So if you haven't been able to concentrate for the last 35, you're normal. That's it.